I remember a guy came to me in worship after worship one time. He says, Ben, he goes, I don't know what's going on, but I just had a weird vision. I said, what is it? He said, I just saw God so on the price is right. <laughs> right before the announcer calls the next contestant. I didn't want to admit it, but I immediately knew what the interpretation was. Because when I was 15, summer before my sophomore year, I may or may not have watched that show a lot during the summer. It was every morning, you know, 10 o'clock, Price is Right, and I may or may not have watched General Hospital with all my children. But listen, that's another issue. So, and I've seen this show so many times. And when I watched it, it was Bob Barker, the announcer was Rod Roddy, and it was the same thing every time. When, when right before they're about to call a contestant, Rod Roddy goes and gets the thing or whatever, everybody's on the edge of their seat. They're, uh, they're all just here. It's all like, they're all jacked up. I mean, they're hyped. This is what they're here for. Their life has come down to this one moment. Everything they've been working for right now is, is all culminating to this one moment on the prize is right. They're all there. You're like, this happened today. I know what's going on. He's calling my name. I can feel it. Can you feel it? Because I can't. It's happening. And everybody's got like, they're like, you know, I love Bob Barker. Kiss me, Bob Barker. They've got all these shirts on and, and they're just on the edge of their seat. This is happening. This is going down. I know it. And then all of a sudden, Rod Roddy gets on. Oh, says something like, Susan Johnson, come on down, you're the next contestant on The Price is Right. And the cameras don't know where she is, so they start panning the crowd. And they find her quickly. You want to know why? She's the one screaming, yeah. flailing her arms, jumping out of her seat. And I promise you, I've watched this show many times. I have never, ever, once seen a contestant slowly walk down the aisle. Like, oh, no big deal. Like, never. They sprint every time. They're just like, Aah! and then they just run down the aisle for their moment. He comes up and he goes, yeah, I had a vision, and God was on the price is right, right before they called it. You know, what's up with that? And I'm like, oh, this, like the Lord is trying to tell us his posture when we pray. You know what happens? We, we get a couple people together. We don't feel like much. We're like, hey, you want to pray? Let's get together and pray. I just feel like I want to go stand right in the middle of the play. And then, that, and then we go and we meet before school. And there's just a couple of us. And it feels a little anemic. And there's only three of us. And we're like, all right, I hope this works, but you know, I don't even know what to do. I don't even really know what to pray, but okay, here we go. You know, God, I just pray you come and visit our campus. And you know what's happening in that moment? God's on the edge of his seat in heaven. And he's just like, well, this is happening today. Oh, I can feel it. This is going on. They're about to call me. Oh, I know it's happening. They're about to call me right now. I know, you know, he's got his I love it Atlanta shirt on. He's like, oh, today is the day. I can feel it. I think they're going to gather this morning and pray. I know there's only three of them, but it don't matter to me. I'm showing up, but they call me. It's happening. I told them I'd come if they'd ask, and so I'm going to come. And I told them I'm near to everybody who calls on me, so here it goes. And then we got, like, you know, our little three-person prayer, and he was like, no, I don't even know what to pray, but, you know, would you come? And God's up in heaven, and he's like, ah! He's high angels on the way out. Listen, you got to get this picture. We're not trying to convince God. We're, we're sons and daughters. He stuck us right in the middle of the play. He stuck us right in the middle of darkness to lift up our voice. Because he responds. He responds. And not only that, you know, God, listen, intercession is that I build the wall. I come right in the middle, right between the dead and the living. And I say, you, death, you cannot take my generation. Violence, you cannot have my generation. Racism, you cannot have my generation. Sexual perversion, you cannot have my generation. God, build the wall. You know what else it is? I start setting meetings up. I'm a secretary. That's what I am. And you know why? Listen, God, this may be a simple illustration, but God is the guy at the party 
that comes with you that really wants to meet that friend of yours. And he's standing next to you at the party. He's like, hey, hey, introduce me to your friend. Hey, come on, come on. Introduce me. Who's your friend over there? Come on, come on, introduce me to your friend. Who's your friend? Come on, introduce me. I really want to meet him. Come on, come on, come on. And we're like, okay, fine, fine, fine. And then, you know, hey, friend, meet, meet God. And God, meet friend. And this is God. And, and in our session, you know what we do? God shows up and goes, hey, listen, that guy, you know, who is that down there? Praise John, you know, he comes from a pretty broken home and doesn't even know you. And God's like, hey, introduce me. Come on, introduce me. I want to meet Hey, come on, come on. Who's that friend? Come on, come on, introduce me. Let me talk to him. Okay, fine, you know. And then in prayer, we get before God, we take out our, our you know, our scheduler, and we say, all right, God, listen, uh, uh, John, when you free, God, when you free, all right, let's make this happen. We set up a meeting. He does it with impossible situations. God all the time is showing up going, hey, is that an impossible situation? Come on, come on, I want to meet him. Seriously, I want to meet that impossible situation. Come on, let me, come on, let me meet him. I'd really like to meet that impossible situation. Come on, let me introduce me. Come on, introduce me. Come on, come on, you know, like, hey, impossible situation, meet God. God, meet impossible situation. Hey, did I hear your friend has cancer? Yeah, come on, I want to introduce me. Come on, introduce me. I want to meet him. Come on. Session is. And again, listen, I'm a high value for. <laughs> I hope you understand I'm not downplaying the elderly lady. But I don't know if your view of intercession is wailing and weeping and groaning, and that's all actually part of it in some way. But, but intercession is just this I'm going to go stand right between the dead and the living. And I'm going to say, You plague actually can't go any further. Like, you're not allowed to touch my campus. You're not allowed to touch my group of friends. You're not allowed to go any farther in my generation. I'm not going to stand for that. And the intercession is, hey, God, listen, there's a guy. I'd really like you to meet him. I think he needs to meet with you. And I get in prayer. You don't even have to get loud. You get in your room at night and say, God, listen, I, I really need you to meet Billy. God, Billy needs to meet you. God, can I set up a meeting where you'll come and meet Billy? And God's like, absolutely. That's what I've been waiting for. See, prayer is birthed out of two places. Prayer is birthed out of intimacy. But prayer is also birthed out of something called responsibility. One of the things that concerns me about this generation, one of the things that concerns me about the culture you're growing up in is that nobody really wants to take responsibility for anything. Right. Somehow it's somebody else's problem and it's not my problem. I live in California and guess what? Charleston, my problem. somebody else, just because I live in California, it's not somebody, that's my problem. But what happens is this, is that we have this thing, in fact there's a verse, there's a story where this widow is about to lose her two sons because she's in debt and the debtors are coming to take them as slaves, as servants. And this lady, the Bible says that she cries out to Elisha to save her sons. And then Elisha comes and God provides a miracle for sons to say, but do you know where her cry came from? A sense of responsibility. Her sons were about to be sold into slavery. That wasn't okay because those were her sons. Those were her kids. I believe at a young age you should be hit with a, a responsibility for your generation. You say, and you'll live differently. Listen to me. If you're a parent, you'll understand this. You live differently when it's your kids. I can go over, you know, Jensen has a, uh, you know, a grandbaby that you see a lot on Instagram. And uh, <laughs> if I went over to their house and that baby's parents were home and I went to sleep and in the middle of the night that baby started waking up crying. Do you know what I do in the middle of the night? I go get some earplugs, I put them in, I put a pillow on my head, I roll over and go back to sleep. It's not my baby. Some, their parents will come get her. Not me. But when I'm home at my house and my child wakes up and starts crying, that's not my response. 
I don't roll over and go back to sleep. I get up and find out what's going on. I was in Southern California. I went to school down there, and it's about a 10-hour drive up to where I grew up in Redding, in Northern California, uh, very close to where the Golden State Warriors just won the championship. But anyways, so, so I was about a 10-hour drive, and I'm 19. I'm with my, me and two other friends take a drive up, and it's, it's like it's Pete is driving. I'm in the middle. We're in a truck. I'm in the middle. My friend Steve is in the passenger. About an hour and a half away from my hometown, ready to pull over to get gas, we pull up to the gas pump. You know, we get out, Pete goes in and pays for the gas, Steve gets some snacks, I go use the restroom, we finish up there, do our stuff, head out the road. About 20 minutes down the road, the truck breaks down on the freeway. It just kind of all of a sudden stops, kind of jerks to a stop. Roll it over the side of the road, we're like, what's going on? And Pete's like, I don't know, I've never had this happen before. And we're just kind of confused, and I look over at the gas gauge, and it's on empty. And uh, I said, uh, Pete, did you put gas in it? Pete's like, no, I, I, I didn't. I went in and paid for it. I thought Steve was putting gas in it. <laughs> Steve looks at me. He's like, I, I didn't put gas. I, I was inside getting snacks. I thought Panny was putting gas in it. They both look at me. I'm like, I didn't put gas in it. I was in the restroom. I thought Pete was putting gas in it. We'd literally driven up to the gas station, pulled up, got all our stuff, never put gas in it, drove off. This is my concern with a generation. I'm telling you right now, God is looking for intercessors in your generation. He's looking for people that will pray. He's looking for people to set up some appointments. He's looking for some people to stand in the gap and put a wall up. But you know what happens? We kind of wake up and we're like, you know, who's interceding for your generation? I don't know, I guess my pastor is. Or I, I think, you know, I think the kid over there that has the cool Christian t-shirt. And they're like, I'm not doing it, I thought my pastor was doing it. I'm not doing it, I thought you were doing it. I'm not doing it, I thought you And we all just think somebody else is going to intercede. We all think somebody else is going to put gas in the truck. Listen, it's your responsibility. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It's not the kid. Listen, it's not that person who knows how to pray. It's not that person who sounds eloquent. It's not that person that knows the Bible more. It's not that person that never sins. You know whose responsibility is? Yours. You, listen, you, you have to live like that. You have to wake up and say, if I don't pray, nobody will pray. If I don't intercede, nobody's going to intercede. It's nobody else's responsibility but mine to stand in the gap where I'm at and lift up my voice and say, God, would you pour out your spirit in my generation? God, would you release an awakening? God, would you save my friends? God, would you stop suicides on my campus? It's your responsibility. I'm going to end with this and the worship team can come up. I'm convinced there's something called Newton's Third Law. You know this law? For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. I actually think in prayer it doesn't apply. Because I think in prayer, and even in the kingdom, for every action, there's not just an equal and opposite reaction. There's a greater and more significant reaction. So, this is why... This is why revival was never started with the masses. I love this room, but what I want from this room is this. Pockets of people to go back to their school, go back to their city, and say, we're going to pray. We're going to take this fire that's burning within us. We're going to join it with incense, and we're going to stand right in the middle of the plague. Because when I asked the boy who had five loaves and two fish, he brought us five loaves and two fish. It, Jesus did not take it and do an equal and opposite reaction. Jesus took it and did a more significant, greater reaction. He took five loaves and two fish and maybe one or two guys and fed 15,000 with it. That's your life in prayer. But what you have to get is this. What, what we're going after and what I want to challenge you with Is that the issue in this room is not whether you're called. 
Every single one of you in this room are called to lead in your generation. Every single one of you in this room are called to change the world. All of you are. That is not the issue. You know what the issue is? Your response. There's a verse I used to hate because I didn't understand it. Matthew 22. Many are called, but few are chosen. I'd get before the Lord my twins and say, God, I don't know what you mean by that. I don't want to be, I don't want to be in the many called category. I want to be in the few chosen category. How do I get out of the many called in that few chosen category? One of the things I hate, hate life, hate with a passion, I hate, is moving, like physically moving. I hate the whole thing. I hate, pack, I hate thinking about it. I hate packing. I hate getting furniture through doors that it doesn't fit in. I hate loading. I hate unpacking. I hate, I hate the whole process of moving. I hate the whole thing. But what I hate more than moving is I hate helping other people move. <laughs> Even worse. People are like, hey, you want to come help me move on Saturday in the middle of August? It's going to be 120, 100% humidity, and you're going to have to move furniture that I'm not even sure how we got in here, and then I'm going to throw a few slices of pizza in as a thank you. And now they call them on Facebook, they call them moving parties. You want to come to my moving party? A moving party? No, I don't at all. <laughs> but the problem in America is if somebody invites you to move, you're stuck because it is the deciding factor whether or not you're a true friend. If you're wondering, I wonder if these guys are my friends. Tell them you're moving on Saturday. Whoever comes, they're your real friends. Everybody else is lying and faking. So if you can imagine this, Pastor Jensen, group of us guys are around. He walks up and says, hey guys, I'm moving on Saturday. Can any of you help? And immediately we're all like, oh my gosh, don't make eye contact with Jesus. Oh, uh, you're with Jesus with Jensen. With Jesus. He's the Jesus of Atlanta. So don't, don't make eye contact with Jensen. And, 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 and we're like, I know there's, I got, I got something going on Saturday. Something, think, Manning, think. He's looking at me, think. And then one guy raises his hand and says, hey, I'll move. I'll help you move. And Jensen says, well, then I choose you. Listen, here's how it works in the kingdom. God comes into a room like this. and says, who will be an intercessor for your generation? Who will give themselves to stand between the dead and the living? Who will lift up your voice in prayer? And immediately people are like, oh my gosh, don't make eye contact with Jesus. Um, I know there's something, I got something going on, like a, that new Beyonce album came out. I'm not sure I can do that, you know, and, and, and I just, you know, I mean, I, I don't even know what else. Uh, I'm not even getting the bachelor out of the bachelor. Let's just leave that one aside. But, um, and then, and then a handful of people go, yeah, Jesus, don't be an intercessor for my generation. And Jesus says, well, then I choose you. The reason why many are called but few are chosen is because there's only a handful of ways of hand. The issue is not the calling. You're all called to change the world. You're all called to lead your generation. You're all called to make a difference. The question you have to answer is, am I willing to raise my hand? Am I willing to be part of the chosen? What I'm here tonight to tell you is this. We came all the way from California to tell you this. God is calling a generation of intercessors in the church. He is saying, will you give yourself to prayer? Will you stand between the dead and the living? Will you build a wall and set up some point in the You may not know how to pray, but that's fine. The disciples didn't either. They asked Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? And you know what? He taught them how to pray. You don't have to know how to pray. Just go pray. Do you know the honest truth is that you get like, you know how you learn how to pray? It's not by reading books. It's by praying. You grab your Bible. You go get in a room somewhere and you say, Jesus, I don't even know how to pray. But the disciples ask, so I'm asking, will you teach me how to pray? And then you go on that journey. You know enough to get together with some friends and say, God, you got to show up on my campus. I'm not going to be satisfied if a plague's taking out my generation. I'm not going to be satisfied if sexual perversion is coming hard and robbing the lives of people. If violence and racism, I'm not going to be, I'm not okay with that. I'm going to stand right down and say, racism, you're not allowed to. You don't, you don't get to come in my generation. You don't get to come and separate the body of Christ. You don't get to come and break up a generation. I'm going to ask.
ask you tonight. This is the call, even as we close this conference. I want you to take the fire that is burning within you. And I want you to put incense with you. And I want you to go back and stand right in the middle of the plague. And I want you to lift up your voice to a God who is a Father who answers your prayers. Who is eager to respond. Who is looking for somebody who will lift up their voice. Who is looking for somebody to gather with a few other people. Lift up their voice in prayer. I believe with all of my heart, you will be part of the greatest revival the world's ever seen. The greatest harvest ever will be in this generation. I want everybody's eyes closed. Everybody's eyes closed. We're about to be done. I know some of you have to get on the road. I'm going to ask this, here in this room tonight, you're not going to stand before God with your friends. You're going to stand before God by yourself. You're not going to be able to use friends as an excuse. It's you and Jesus right now. He is looking at you. He's not looking at somebody else. He's looking at you. And he's saying, will you be an intercessor for your generation? Will you lay your life down in prayer for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Will you stand and build a wall? Will you get up on the wall and be a watchman? Will you set up appointments? Okay. 